according to the data collected by the Journal of Pan-African Studies, an overwhelming majority of black people, 88%, say the country needs to continue making changes for black people to have equal rights with whites, but 43% are skeptical that such change will ever occur. In other words, minorities feel the effects of inequality on an unproportional level to the point where many have lost hope on equality for all. Hi, my name is Hannah McDallum. Hi, my name is Savannah Peterson. Hi, my name is Gloriana Valladares Lima. Hi, my name is Shania Brown. And to build on what Hannah said, failure to tackle social inequality and discrimination impacts individuals and their families, which in turn affects society as a whole. Despite this, minorities still face inequality on a social level, which impacts society on an economic and political level, as well as the health of these minorities. And that leaves the question of how does race and ethnicity affect how people are treated and perceived in the United States? After extensive research, it has been concluded that diverse ethnicities are not equal in the United States because of how they are perceived. The collective solution to this problem would to be include classes, school classes, that promote cultural tolerance, tolerance and exposure. This way, future generations are more exposed to understanding and accepting of people from different backgrounds. A prime example of why we need a solution is that minorities feel the need to change themselves in order to be accepted and successful in society. An example of this would be resume whitening. This is when people of color change um, and adopt to a Western guide in order to be fit into the white stereotype. In a study conducted by administrative scientists, 64% of people admitted to consciously taking part in resume whitening and 67% of people knew of someone who had taken part in resume whitening. This doesn't even count for the people who resume whiten subconsciously. This means minorities don't have the same economical, economical opportunities because of the way they look. This is because they are often denied job opportunities and promotions. These economical disadvantages that minority face are often widen the inequality gap and um, hinder societal advancement and growth. Additionally, Asian healthcare workers who make up 19.6% of U.S. physicians and 8.4% of U.S. nurses face heightened racial discrimination. These are the types of scenarios in which an ethnic person is likely to change themselves in order to feel safe and successful in society, whether that be through resume whitening or changing one's identity. Depersonalization, derealization disorder, also known as DDD, is a type of disassociative disorder that is highly linked to post-traumatic stress disorder, also known as PTSD. PTSD is characterized by the reoccurrence of a traumatic event. According to the DSM-5, if you have symptoms of PTSD, as well as one as of a disassociative disorder, such as changing one's identity, you may be diagnosed with this disorder. If minorities continue to feel the pressure to change themselves, the rate for this diagnosis will only continue to grow. To add to what Hannah and Savannah just said, certain predisposed biases and stereotypes can cause minorities to feel unsafe in their everyday lives. From 1896 until today, filmmakers have collectively indicated all Arabs as public enemy number one, brutal and heartless. People learn biases from what they see portrayed in the media, creating stereotypes or caricatures in their heads that are not accurate. This results in a rise in hate crimes and laws that target the groups who are stereotyped. For example, Shortly after 9-11, the federal government hurriedly enacted a corpus of legislation targeting Muslims and Arabs in the Uniting and Strengthening America by providing appropriate tools required to intercept and obstruct terrorism act of 2001, also known as the Patriot Act. 9-11 was a tragedy for the United States, but it also served as an event to vilify Arabs and Muslims who now call the United States their home. Since then, Islamophobia has only increased. Not only is this generalizing two groups of people, it is also assuming that all Arabs are Muslims, which is not the case. In addition, a 70-year-old female refugee, Habiba, even mentioned that when you leave home, you are a refugee. You can still be in your own house, but you will live in fear. Refugees are fleeing dangerous situations in search of asylum, but when they reach what should be a safe place, they are instead confronted with stereotypes, misconceptions, and xenophobia.
It should be easy to see that this type of experience can be hurtful to our minority, since it creates a sense of isolation and loneliness. In this case, Arabs and Muslims are singled out as terrorists, and even though the vast majority of them aren't. This applies to all minorities. Individuals who experience racism have higher levels of anxiety, guilt, and numbness compared to individuals who do not. This can create an anxiety disorder of itself, which can create more stress and overall worsens one's mental health. To further build on what Savannah just said, this chart summarizes the data collected for a lawsuit against New York City's stop and frisk policy. As you can see, around 80% of the people who were stopped were either African American or Hispanic. This is just another example of how the bias that Caucasians with authority hold against people of color can cause them to feel unsafe in their everyday lives, worsening any existing anxiety. To expand on what Gloriana said, due to lower income, minorities have less access to better housing and education. Local control has been an effective mechanism used to limit certain types of housing, typically affordable and associated with lower income residents such as African Americans. Typically, high cost of living relates to income disparities and um, inaccessibility of education. This chart shows Latinx men and women from different countries and the frequency at which they gain legal status in the United States. Most of these individuals are undocumented, which affects their economic status. However, the government makes it difficult for these people to gain legal status in the United States, which essentially leaves them in a constant state of poverty. Earlier in the presentation, we saw a solution before, but another option would be to have more anonymity and in job interviews to lessen racial bias so it doesn't affect hiring rates. However, there are a few limitations to this solution. One, it is very general. It can be seen as inconvenient. Two, every company has its own hiring policy. Therefore, they won't want to implement something new. And three, big corporations wouldn't want to do it because they have a certain image they want to uphold, and some ethnic groups and racial groups don't fall into that image. Based on these limitations, it is clear to see that the best solution would be the solution shown earlier, seeing that will have the most effectiveness on a national scale. Thank you. Sorry, let me scribble down something. Oh, take your time. Oh, thanks. <laughs> okay, uh, we're just gonna, um, Hannah, we'll start with you and then go that way across with the questions. Uh, so Hannah, you get the first one. What's an example of a compelling argument from one of your peers, research from one of your peers' research that you decided not to include in the presentation and then why? So in Gloriana's research, she mentioned something about gender roles and that was a great point because um, within households, um, different cultures and ethnicities um, run their houses differently. And that in turn leads to how children are raised and women and men see each other differently within ethnicities. And that was a great point because it really shows how ethnicities are treated unequal within the household. But we didn't want to focus on a more broad and general scale and how um, Americans and people who are considered the majority of America see those minorities. All right, thank you. Next up. Um, what's the way in which your team's resolution makes you think differently about your own research? So I didn't know a lot about this subject when we started, so I didn't know what resume whitening was. So when Hannah explained it to me, it made me realize that from a health perspective, a lot of minorities struggle with their mental health because they have to change themselves. All right, thank you. Next up, uh, describe an argument from one of your peers' research that makes you think differently about your team's solution. Um, so to add, like um, Hannah said, there was resume whitening, but um, again, I didn't know what it was. So being able to add resume whitening and code switching to our argument, I felt like it gave us, it gave our argument a stronger, what's the word, like a stronger statement, you know what I mean? So like it gave us what we really needed to bring our argument off the edge. Okay, thank you. And last question. Um, if you had another team member, so say there's a fifth person on your team, what perspective could they have reached that would have been um, a helpful contribution to the whole project? Um, I would have had them do the perspective of immigration, just because even though it's not like as 
even though it's not as much of its own perspective as economical or political or social um, behavior and treatment, it still connects really well with the points. And like the healthcare perspective, it sort of shows the effects of inequality in the United States, and it would just really help tie the presentation together.